Let's pray, though. While you're doing it, that's okay. We're going to pray, and you can keep passing, and we'll pray for you. And God, we thank you. We thank you, thank you. We cannot outgive you. You are a God of amazing generosity, and you display it through your people every day. And now we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would not only honor you, but inspire us to be your witnesses in this world and all of God's children said. Amen. I want to share with you a text I got from a friend of mine this week. Here's how it went. Good afternoon. I thought I would share with a need. I have a need to share with you. I've lost my joy. I just had a conversation with a peer, a former work associate, who shared with me she not only has lost her joy, she does not even know where her joy is anymore. I cannot help but wonder if there are others feeling the same way as Halloween crashes into a very commercial Christmas. Since working in retail, the joy and excitement and anticipation of Christmas has been tarnished. Christmas shows up in August. We have months to sell, 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 and hours put in to support that mentality. This is a person describing a sense where of our culture where people have lost that sense of their giftedness of life. We live in a culture where we've replaced the sacredness of life with with commoditation of relationships, describing relationships as commodities. She continues with this. This friend of mine says, I think there is just not enough appreciation and gratitude in the in the people in the world. Not that I need to have people falling over me or trying to thank me or be near me, but just appreciate what was done for you. Be grateful someone thought of you instead of moving right on to the next. What can you do for me now? Someone who works in retail and has felt that overwhelming sense of how we move from holiday to holiday. It becomes a number. It becomes an amount It becomes something about me rather than it is an extension of God's grace and possibility in the world. This is a person, in their own words, have felt at times beat down. This letter, 1 Peter chapter 3, is being written to a community of Christians who probably feel exactly the same way. See, their, their, multi, their environment in which this church has, has fledgling church has grown is a multicultural environment. And, and what they're feeling is harassment from folks around them. They're, they're feeling abuse. And at the very least, they're feeling no support within their culture and community for being followers of Christ and believers in God. But the writer calls them not to abandon the call. The writer of Peter calls them and us not to kind of circle the rag, circle the wagons and, and protect our own. The writer of First Peter, in the midst of these people who feel beat down and overwhelmed, sometimes harassed and abused, says this in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And then I'll read 13 through 15. To conclude... You must all have the same attitude and the same feeling. Love one another as brothers, and I would add sisters. And be kind and humble with one another. Do not pay back evil with evil or cursing with cursing. Instead, pay back with a blessing. Because a blessing is what God promised to give you when he called you. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy you are. Do not be afraid of anyone and do not worry, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope that you have in you. But do it with gentleness and do it with respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will become ashamed of what they say. Writer Peter is saying and reminding them as he's reminding us that in a secular culture, in a culture that turns people 
and events into commodities that can be monetized, that has lost sometimes its sense of giftedness, its sense of sacredness, the sense of the giftedness of a, of a beauty of a sunrise in the morning that, that loses the sacredness of the sense of, of tears that flow out of laughter or, or loses the, the sense of the holiness, the solemn holiness of, of, deep, of deep and abiding grief. Writer says, we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed in order to be a blessing. And it's not the first time the words we read in, in, in Peter are, it's not the first time we've heard them in Scripture. That somehow, even in the midst of difficult times in a, in a culture that, that moves in one direction and you feel the call and, and urge of heart of God to move you in another direction, that's not the first time that, that we hear this call to, to be a blessing in the lives of others, even in the midst of challenges. Paul writes in Romans, Ask God to bless those who persecute you. Ask Him to bless, not to curse. If someone has done you wrong, do not repay him with a wrong. Try to do what everyone considers to be good. Do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everybody. Never take revenge, my friends, but instead let God's anger do it. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay back, says the Lord. If indeed, as the scripture says, your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you will make him burn with shame. Do not let evil defeat you. Instead, conquer evil with good. Wasn't it Jesus who said, we are to pray for who? Even our enemies. Forgiving those who persecute you. See, we are blessed to be a blessing. And what what the writer of Peter says is, is that even when life is hard and you feel over harassed and you feel abused and beaten down, he says, he says there's still a place you can go. There's still this, this unresiding commitment of God to you that even in the midst of that, we can still try to be a blessing in the lives of others. And in the far analysis, when you feel like you're overwhelmed, leave the judgment up to God. And trust in God at that point. But Mike, I've lost my joy. I've lost my joy. How do I be a blessing when I've lost my joy? Maybe that's one reason why we've been been talking about the disciples' path these last five weeks. That's what the footprints are coming into the sanctuary. That followers of Jesus, lovers of God, people who feel this stirring of God's grace in their heart, there are five critical elements that, that God gives us and pours out to us so we can join God in being change makers one life at a time in the world. Remember week one we talked about the power of community, of the gathered people with Christ. Jesus said where two or more are gathered there, I will be found in the midst of them. Whether it's a small group or worship. And sometimes, if you're like me, you come in here and you don't have the words to pray. But there's someone in here who's strong enough that day to pray for you. And some days, you may come in here strong in your faith, and there's someone in here feeling very weak and beaten down and needs you to be the one to pray for them. There's something about the gathered community that encourages and inspires and releases the power of God's Spirit in our lives. We talked in the second week about the power of generosity. Remember the, the man who, who got this amazing blessing by God and he already had ba- ba- uh, excuse me barns to contain his harvest, but he had way more than he had anticipated. So instead of just filling those barns and giving away the extra blessing to God, and he decided to tear down what he had and build even more storage to hold it for God's self, for himself, instead of being rich towards others and rich towards God. And and there's something about generosity that feels good, doesn't it? Something about generosity that overwhelms and overflows. Week three, we talked about the power of serving, how it's important for this time, for such a time as this, that that we share our skills and our time and our talent, how much it feels good to serve, to put others' needs above you. That's a power, power power of the Holy Spirit 
inside of us. That's how we begin to walk with the frequency of God when we begin serving others. And last week we talked about this grounding thing, this centering thing we call prayer. We talked about acts, remember, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. That just like Jesus, there are days when we need to go away to a quiet place and maybe just lament, maybe just be present, but always inviting God to help us see the life, the world from God's heart, not just our own. And finally today, 1 Peter says, be prepared to defend the story of hope that is in you. Do you have a story? We heard Travis's and Lori's story. What about your story of hope? Is there a story of hope being weaved in you that God is now weaving into God's larger story? I know sometimes, you know, we we hear about our story and, and God's movement and we think, my story is not much of a story. You know, when I compare it to, to my friend who's, who had a friend that had an amazing blessing in their life, I don't have a story like that. Or we look at the Apostle Paul who was literally changed from a persecutor of the church to the primary impetus for the church going worldwide. And we say, I don't have a story like that. Sometimes we doubt the power of our personal story. Every one of us has a story. And I think one of the greatest tools that we can use to get in touch with our story is to do what Ashley talked about. Create a gratitude inventory. And begin to fill out an inventory of the things that you are grateful for. And, and don't do this, which is what I've found myself doing. As I fill it, I go, I go, yeah, that's cool. Oh, I love the snow falling right now. But... Those poor people died in India. Or, or, or we say something we're grateful for and we think it doesn't really count and compare it to something else. Claim your story. Write down an inventory of the ways in which you've experienced God moving in your life and just look at it. Don't do anything with it, but just look at it and claim it. Because I'll bet you if your life is like mine, it's got challenges. You feel beaten down sometimes. You, you feel like sometimes the world is heading in one direction and your heart's in another direction. But you have a story. You have a story to live and a story to tell. And that's the fifth element, that we become blessings because we know we too have been blessed. And that's what I want us to do right now. To, to write on your piece of fruit, your, your offering piece of fruit, and bring it to, the, to these two walls. There'll be people here that will pin them on there. When you're done writing and passing the pen, bring it on up. And Linda, if you'll play some music for us while that is going up. And if there's someone near you that can't come up, then give your, give your Thanksgiving fruit to someone else and let them come up and, and set it up here. And then we'll end in prayer and then in a song. What is that which you are grateful for today?